Good afternoon, everyone, or late morning, if you're speaking to us from the left coast. Um, this is Tim Sarantonio, Director of Strategic Partnerships at Neon One. Uh, really excited for today's presentation today. I uh, just want to go over a few housekeeping items as we have people roll in. Um, uh, let me just minimize this. So, um, First and foremost, today's topic, the impact loop to optimizing pivotal moments in your fundraising life cycle. This is going to be a, I can guarantee you folks, it's going to be freewheeling conversation. It's going to be a wild ride today. I'm really excited uh, about uh, the conversation that we're going to have. We're going to, we're going to try to zero in um, uh, and focus our stream of consciousness that, that our panelists sometimes get into in a really fun way, though, to give you some really tactical items that you can act on. Um, Practically speaking, this is being recorded at the moment and will be uploaded into our Neon One YouTube channel later on. Uh, it is also the type of thing that that GoToWebinar is kind of nifty. You can come back and maybe later today, uh, you know, we'll get that up uh, tomorrow at the latest. But you can also go back and access the recording through uh, the event registration that you you went through too. So that's a kind of a nifty feature that they allow. So multiple ways to access the recording. And we're going to follow up. Uh, we actually have some concrete resources and, and uh, tools available that we think that are going to help with the conversations that we're going to be speaking today, especially um, a, a nice guide that our partners at Firefly Partners have put together. Um, but practically speaking, um, you know, we're, we're paying attention. There's a question and answer uh, item that uh, that we can definitely uh, uh, check out. Um, we want this to be conversational as much as possible. You know, we're getting hit with a lot of different webinars, so let's make this interactive and, and definitely feel free to to ask us questions and thoughts. Um, in terms of today uh, today's host, if you're not familiar with Neon One, um, the Neon One ecosystem uh, it provides a wide variety of tools, so digital engagement, um, constituent relationship management, um, giving events, uh, uh, you, you know, but then we also extend this out to certified consultants, service partners, and integrations. Uh, so the Neon One ecosystem really is just, you know, we know that change is hard, especially in these times. Uh, so so being able to kind of guide you through that is really vital for for, for uh uh, your success, and, and we we serve over 35,000 organizations with our tools. Uh, we also already have a Q and A. Can't understand me at all. Can you folks hear me? I can hear you. Yeah, you can hear me. I can hear you. Thank you. Sorry, Stephanie. Uh, I would I would say my wife would probably say the same thing though. So. <laughs> Um, so, but seriously, though, if there's an audio problem, our team might be able to try to help or, or uh, definitely try switching from phone to computer or vice versa. That typically helps solve it. Um, so we do have a member of the Neon One team on standby. If there's any uh, kind of technical issues or questions that we can point you to. Um, and then also uh, there is a handout of today's deck. There's some resources that we're going to kind of use as a, hey, we think you should check this out, but aren't necessarily going to be the, the complete focus of today. Uh, we just spent a little time curating some things that we think will be useful to follow up on. So definitely download the deck um, for those at the very minimum, as well as uh, we actually do have Neon One's Generosity Exchange virtual conference coming up in August, and so early bird tickets are, are actually on, uh, still on sale for the time being, but uh, got some really, really great content coming there. So uh, without further ado, our guests for today, I, I think I'm going to start renaming this slide guests as opposed to speakers, by the way, because you are our guests. Uh, I have Taylor Shanklin and T. Clay Buck. Uh, Taylor's from Firefly Partners and uh, Clay's from Tactical Fundraising Solutions. So Taylor, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and Firefly for, for the folks uh, out, out, out there today. Sure, hey there. And Tim, you totally made that joke about your wife, right, as I took a sip of coffee. Please don't, you know, make those anymore in the intro now. Well, <laughs> well, she's not here anymore either. So for almost every <laughs> webinar that we've had over the past few months, she would be right behind me and I'd have an audience to play off of. So yeah. Yeah, um, I like it, anyway. I like it. Thank well, you. Thanks for having me on as a guest, Tim. I'm Taylor Shanklin. I'm the Vice President of Growth at Firefly Partners. and Firefly is a digital marketing and strategy agency. We work with a lot of organizations on their digital solutions. 
from building out what you need to do on a platform like Neon to um, thinking through your overall digital marketing and branding and what your website looks like. And our overall goal is to help you create better, more human connections through digital solutions. So happy to be here. I'm happy to talk to T. Clay and have this um, riveting conversation. Clay, what's up? Who are you? Uh, you know, I'm just, I'm just a guest. I'm just happy to be here. And Taylor, I feel like we're continuing a conversation that we've been having now for uh, a couple of years. So I'm the founder of Tactical Fundraising Solutions. I'm an independent fundraising consultant after being frontline for a lot of decades, uh, sort of launched my own shingle. And I focus uh, on working with nonprofits in strategy and tactics based on systems and data and process and how we really think about improving fundraising through looking at the whole uh, of it. Um, but Taylor and I met, uh, I've done a few other things here and there. Taylor and I met through being a part of the uh, ROGARE, the fundraising think tank, uh, the U.S. Critical Fundraising Report a couple of years ago. So uh, we're, we're just picking up on a, on a conversation that we've been having for a, a long, long time. So happy to be here. Yeah. Awesome. Well, and and yeah. thanks thanks for both of you for joining us. Uh, I I I turn to our partners a lot in terms of of how we want to build out the Neon One ecosystem. It, you know, one of the big things that we understand is that uh, we don't always have the answers, and and to be able to turn to our broader network of people that we trust is is extremely important. Uh, so that's why I'm really excited for today's conversation. And and the way that we're going to be doing this, folks, is it's going to be kind of a, a freewheeling conversation for a large part of it, but we are going to get focused near the end in terms of some specific tools and applications that might be able to help you. Um, and so uh, the way that that we're going to generally do it, I'm going to give a few kind of framing devices for today. We're not going to pause on these. These are just to have you understand where we're going to think about the conversation today. So the first one is, is you know, when when we hear the phrase impact loop, what does that mean? Besides awesome roller coasters, love the imagery that our team came up with that one. I was like really jazzed actually. Uh, and then the other one, um, oh, did I did it get taken out? Did you move it, Clay? I haven't yes, touched it. Okay, I, well, I touch it. all right. So then the other one is digital versus direct mail. Is that even the right question anymore, right? And so I do want to go back and Clay. I want you to kind of introduce these two slides to kind of help frame the kickoff for today's conversation, which is, you know, impact, cycles, channels. How does this relate to the concept of the donor vortex? Right, so, yeah, um, and when you said impact loop uh, to me when we first started talking about this, right? I mean, it, it, from a true systems thinking approach, if we think about systems, all systems are kind of managed by those feedback loops. We know a system is working by looking at the feedback from it for fundraising, its metrics, its, you know, functionality, it's, you know, all of those things. So that's immediately where I went in thinking about impact loop, which made me think of this um, from Claire Axelrad. And if if you're not familiar with Claire, um, her her work is is just phenomenal and constantly um, on point, just a, a, a tremendous thinker and writer and author and sharer of um, great information. So she, she wrote this article, I want to say it's been six or seven years ago now, right? Death, rest in peace donor pyramid, where we think of the, the traditional donor pyramid where a donor comes in at the bottom and right, and then we move them to major gifts and then we move them to plain giving and right, and it's this, it's this And then linear, they die and then, and then that's it. Correct, right? It's this linear path. Claire says, and, and all of the data that we are seeing now uh, supports this, that the donor pyramid in that very linear cause effect approach is, is, is essentially dead. It doesn't work. But the modern model is more like a vortex, an energized circle where everyone is equal, people moving in and out and is needed. And our job as fundraisers is to keep the energy flowing. And I believe that wholeheartedly. And I think we've seen that from the data with donors moving from channel to channel, channels no longer a, a true segmentation tool like perhaps it maybe used to be or maybe we thought it was. And people will make a major gift over here and a smaller one-time gift over here and they'll go to an event over here and there's they, they're giving on Facebook and they're giving on wherever else and then they send a check and you just, 
keeping that whole energy and cycle moving that the relationship is how they define it not how we want to pigeon and pull them into what we think is best or what our needs are but being responsive to that donor and how they move we know um we, Nick, do you want to kind of move, tell me when you want to move into the next slide in terms of yeah, channel. Yeah, next one's good. Sure. Okay. Yeah. And then we're going to get off the slides generally. Right, because yeah. this is yeah. just, and, and I always use these two slides because I think they so, are so indicative of what we're seeing that 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 we know and we see it from report after report after report and experience after experience that 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 this donor vortex, if you will is multi-channel people aren't necessarily sticking to one channel they're not making a gift via digital and then you know staying in digital the whole time they may write a check and we were just talking about that and yes people still do write checks especially in the united states right people still do there you go <laughs> there you go i cross right. i made sure to cross out my banking information folks. <laughs> you smart. can't, you can't, you can't go back digits? What are the three digits on the back of your credit card, Tim? Um, <laughs> this <code> right. Is. <laughs> right. So, in in this this is one report from many that are out there that show the more present we are as fundraisers in multiple channels, and in being good at telling our stories across multiple channels and opening that door for donors across multiple channels, the stronger the results and the stronger the responses are. Yes. Yes. Yeah, I like it. I hadn't actually seen that vortex thing before until you showed it to us, Clay. And it makes so much sense in the fact that, like the pyramid, like donors don't think about themselves in a pyramid. They're not like, oh, I'm going to be a college student and I'm going to volunteer because I have no money, and then I'm going to make a little money in my thirties, and then I'm going to become a major donor, and then I'm going to be the plan donor, and then die. Like they don't think about it that way. No. They think about how am I engaging with things that matter to me, right? And so like, as you think about the impact loop and multi-channels, you have to like get into their brains more and stop, I think like using so much of that like jargon almost in a way where it's like, like we just put that on the donors, but they don't think that way. So mm -hmm. I'm glad that you brought that up. Uh, this is, and this is gonna come out of left field, but that's kind of the nature of where I, I thought this would happen. The reason that data is so important though is that that memory is very selective right and so i think a lot of times if we think about our donors we think of them in in almost monolithic ways or or we might think about specific donors in in and say oh you know i remember when they were at this event or something like that and you're trying to use your memory and it and it jogs have you, any of you ever read the book from chuck klosterman sex drugs and cocoa puffs i heard so, of it haven't read it it's a great book. It's a great yeah. book. It's my mom back in the day. She's like, this book is stupid. But I, I thought it was very funny. And there was one thing that he talked about in terms of human relationships. This isn't necessarily donor stuff, but I think that it comes down to very kind of core items. And hey, raise your hand if you've read the book, um, uh, so to speak. So there's a thing that he talks about with Saved by the Bell, the the terrible 90s show with with uh, Mark Paul Gossenler and, and uh uh, you know, Zach Morris, AC oh. Slayer, Screech, all that type oh. of stuff, right? Yeah, call me yeah. and time out, right? And yeah. so, the but there was a thing during the final season where some characters on the show got into a contract dispute and then left. So then they added a new character named Jesse that was a love interest for, not Jesse. Um, oh, why am I blanking on her name? They, uh, uh, okay, if anybody in the crowd remembers the name, then please. Um, oh, and somebody's actually Everybody yelling at her. Her. terrible. Okay, but they added another character, and and she she had like leather jacket on, and she was supposed to be like vying for the attention of AC Slater and Zach, and then and then then they had the graduation episode, and that woman just disappeared. But the other, it was Tori. Thank you, Tori. Tori was the character. Yeah. And then, but then I remember her. But then Kelly Kapowski came back and Jesse Spano came back for graduation and Tori was never heard from again. And Chuck Klosterman talked about this, that many human relationships, we tr we tend to think them as like almost like a linear engagement. But there's often many months of reality where it's like, no, we hung out like totally. We, we hung out all the time. And it's like, no, man, I was like in I was in Europe for six months. Right. And so relationships we tend to 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 misalign them or misremember the reality and tying this back to donor engagements 
we take donors for granted sometimes because they we always think that they're there mm -hmm. right right yes and yes. and mm -hmm. data needs to be there to 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 either prove or disprove that but we also can't assume that they're always going to be there for us people's lives happen things come up and mm -hmm. and so yeah, hopefully well, maybe i'll get a blog post at a saved by the bell in terms of this but clay you look <laughs> hilariously confused during that entire no i'm not confused <laughs> I'm, I'm just old um <clears throat> No, it's it, but it, it's Mark Phillips. If you've ever seen Mark Phillips from yes. from Blue Frog in the UK present, right? What what is it? He says it's she is not one of your donors. You are one of yep. her charities. We have yep. to shift our thinking to that. Be, be, you're right. The data is there, but the the data tells us when they gave and what they gave and what they yep. gave to. Mm -hmm. What we yep. don't know is is what was that emotional moment? Moment. What was that thing that connected to their values? that prompted them to give. If we hold that thought that giving is always an expression of values, of belief, right? Then then that has to inform how we approach the multi-channel vortex and how we approach the relationships. They're not there for us. We're there for them. Mm -hmm. We're mm -hmm. there, we're there to help them realize the vision of the world that they want to see through a nonprofit's mission. That's that that's the critical shift here. Our job then in managing the vortex is to connect to that and keep that connection alive. So Taylor, for, for what you've seen in the past few months, because I know Clay and I have talked about this in some capacities, and you and I have too, but but kind of stating it mm -hmm. to you, you know, the past few months there's been we've seen such an emphasis on digital, obviously, for for mm -hmm. for practical means, but also some companies that's how they make their livelihood in many ways so the, where does the the truth lie when it comes to to where the quote unquote impact is going to be seen there though yeah in digital digital versus or in, what people should actually be concentrating on at the end of the day because because you know mm. we can start sharing some data in general, and I even had some internal data from the Neon One ecosystem that speaks to this, but uh, you know, we're getting inundated with so much digital stuff, and it's obviously important, mm -hmm. but especially as a you know, a firm that works in, in heavily in the digital space, where do you fall on this? Yeah, yeah. You know, I think that digital and direct mail still need to work together and different types of engagement points need to work together and don't like I mean, I like to do digital all day long. That's where I grew up in the nonprofit space. It's what I care about. So I've helped build technology platforms to help people fundraise. And so like, that's what matters to me. But I recognize that it is looking at the way that your brand and your case for support and how you're talking about yourself and all of these other touch points, they tie into digital. So like one of the things that's been coming up a lot lately being a digital agency is people coming to us and saying we had a walk we can't do the walk now because of covid or we had a gala we can't do the gala now like we've got to take this to virtual and one of the things i think is important to think about in terms of like making the digital pivot um and we we did a whole you know series on that together is how do you look at engagement that you would have in other channels whether that's like i used to go meet my donors for coffee right or guess what the post office is still open so you can still send mail to people and like like that's not turned off so let's not forget that but how do you actually create an authentic experience online the walk that you've always done might not be the same walk if you're doing it digital like i think you have to in making that pivot to digital right now it's super important it's where the world's going like i said i'll talk about it all day long but it's important to think about like how is my online fundraising now different than it was before when there was this mix of in-person like an in-person event happening as like a culmination of fundraising before the event and how do i drive that engagement in an interesting way that doesn't just feel noisy um because that's one of the problems too like i don't know about you guys i mean i'm 
I'm getting social media overload and I'm like a social media fangirl all day long. You know, people give me flack sometimes about like, God, oh, you just post everything like 20 times a day. And I'm like, I'm just very engaged, you know? And now I'm just like, I'm even getting a little bit overloaded. I've, I've so I think that's something to think about. Yeah. 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 I, I mean, our Twitter wars, they're fewer and far between lately. No. <laughs> Yes, yes. Well, and we, my feed has slowed down immeasurably because you two have stopped. <laughs> now, Clay, I, uh, so I don't know, chart, does that answer what you're getting at, Tim? It does. I think it opens up a lot more questions, though, in, in, in many ways. Yeah. But before mm -hmm. getting into that, and, 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 and Clay, I wanted to go back to the chart that you showed, which, and I'll show it again for everybody just in case to remind us. Um, Talk about the technical difference, and this is our, our friend Brady over at Next After, I know, in terms of this, but but kind of walk us through, what's the difference between offline with valid email and a proper multi-channel definition? Uh, my understanding was that offline with valid email from the study meant, right, these, these were responses to a direct mail piece, but they had a, a, an email address on file. record that was valid, so they were getting communications, not necessarily the ask. I, I could be wrong, I could be slightly off in describing that study, but um, the true monthly channel was the whole offer, the whole package was offered across both platforms. So direct mail sort of supported by digital so followed up by digital or right and 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 honestly this is what i see with most of the the nonprofits that i'm working with now is it's it's no longer you know drop and go it's that appeal that direct mail appeal is supported by an email appeal that comes you know a week and a half later or is timed correctly along with a social media feed right that it's it's across all of these platforms but Taylor I think to your point mm -hmm. um, yeah. we we have to get really good at this you know we're I think we're all over digitized um, if you will I mean I had seven hours of zoom meetings the other day and and I hear it from so many people we want to get away from our screens which I think puts the pressure on all of us and the admonition the encouragement if you will right to get really good at how we tell our stories and how we present ourselves as charities in a digital space it's we got it we yeah. it's no longer just throw up a giving page or do a post it's, we got to get way past that into this level of really true systemic engagement i think one of the things that i always lean back when i was when i still help nonprofits and when i do my own work and when i did do work that i found effective was kind of an iterative process right where where i think a lot of times we put we put our appeals and our campaigns, you know, and our and even sometimes our metrics in little little time boxes mm -hmm. or little little tag boxes, you know. Where yep. it's like, mm -hmm. okay, I even remember having arguments: do we name the campaign field the year and the thing, or is it just the thing and then it's the 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 date range covers us for that type of stuff, right? And mm -hmm. and uh, and we actually even unpack that same question with Robin Cabral in 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 one of our sessions, by the way. So check out our YouTube channel for that. But what what we found? Let's talk about some data at this point. So Clay, I I, I would love for you to talk a little bit about um uh you know what I can talk about the fundraising effect in this project kind of overall stuff um but uh maybe touching on the giving usa what did we see from giving usa that just came out that that may be um yeah giving usa did just come out so it's still relatively new and i think a lot of us are still kind of unpacking the results and we're going to be um, doing a deeper dive for neon yeah. one later later I mean, next it hasn't month, even, by the way. it really hasn't even been out a week yet I think. yeah no it takes um, a while to unpack that report well it does take a while to unpack mm. it and it it, it also it, you know, it comes out halfway through the year and goodness, 2020, like blow it all up. Who knows what's going to happen? You know, you sort of do look at it and go, well, I don't know, but the last six months, who knows? Um, and for people but, who just, just why don't you describe what the Giving USA report is for, for if people don't know, by the way. Yeah, sure. So Giving USA analyzes data from multiple sources and looks at giving trends from the year before. So this is looking at calendar year 2019. Um, and Tim, you may know the actual sources a little better than I do, but it's looking at tax data, it's looking at tax returns, it's looking at a lot of 990 data, data, yeah, 990 data, et cetera. Um, 
And so, and, and so Neon One is a member of the Giving Institute who creates the report and they team up with the Lilly School of Philanthropy to do right. like a really deep dive. It's, it's like, folks, if you haven't checked it out, it is one of the best kind yeah. of barometers of success for the industry that, that we can kind of leverage against. Because it also deal, drives into uh, donor advice funds, foundation giving. Uh, as well as into specific types of nonprofits. So it's like, how did healthcare perform versus arts and culture and things of that nature? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Uh, uh, the Giving USA report, Giving USA report. So Clay, what did they see in 2019? Yeah, so again, another uh, another year where we saw increase in giving from individuals increased by 4.7%, almost 5%. But we also saw it. They also saw it across um, across multiple. Uh, so giving by foundations was up. Giving by corporations was up. Like it was a very good year for for giving, especially looking at, at it in light of the tax changes and and all of that. I, I tend to lean towards and keep seeing that the key thing is giving by individuals far outweighs, and especially when you factor in bequest giving. Right, giving by individuals made up 69%. If you add bequests to that, right, your bequest being something an individual leaves in their will, right, you're, you're at 79% came from individuals. So it, it tends to always point us every year to the strongest source of fundraising income is individuals. How are individuals accessing charities? It's Mm -hmm. by mail, by face-to-face, -face, by digital, right? And that's where an important mm -hmm. distinction is as well, folks, because if we also compare that to, to some other research on the nonprofit for the National Council of Nonprofits, this is still just individual giving. This does not include things like program service fees, tuition, mm -hmm. program mm -hmm. fees, program mm -hmm. income, uh, government mm -hmm. grants in many ways is, is also segmented out when it comes to this type of stuff. So, you, you know, your own organizations um, you know, you might, we all put a lot of emphasis on individual giving, um, but a lot of organizations still rely on, on things like grants, program fees and whatnot to, to make up their stuff. Right, now, right. the reality is, especially right. in certain, you know, a, a political uh, climate like this, that's completely uncertain. Um, it's important to develop relationships and maintain relationships with individual donors of any size because you never know what's going to happen on the program side but you you can control you can control your relationships with your individual donors and that's mm -hmm. that's one of the key things that mm -hmm. that I, I think is a takeaway for this now mm -hmm. one thing that now that was 2019 and i think that's obviously really important data to unpack but lily school uh, even had their own breakout that was like what happens if something terrible like they uh, it was actually in october where they're mm -hmm. like but that was like something really bad happened in the next few years. Like, and it, it was funny to have them go back and go, so yeah, we kind of, we're trying to anticipate this, but they didn't realize it was to potentially this extent. And so the fundraising effectiveness project, which Neon One is one of the, the data partners on, uh, found that giving in the first quarter, um, what did it fall by? Six percent, six percent. Um, uh, you know, with with it, donor retention continuing to fall, which is another red flag, but I don't want to freak everybody out because there was a silver lining of donor donors who are what is quote unquote small bucket donors, donors under $250 actually increased by 5.8%. The Chronicle mm -hmm. Philanthropy article is wrong, by the way, it was not 6%, it was... 5.8 percent but i digress um so that's important though that's important because a lot of those folks we are seeing in our own ecosystem coming in through things like giving events coming in through uh simple outreach and saying hey why don't you give us 10 bucks a month it's like a cup of coffee you know every few yeah. days that type of appeal mm -hmm. But um, that's going to be a healthy combination of peer to peer campaigns, another way that we see those small dollar donors. But the retention on those folks, especially first time donors, is around 20%. So that's the concern here is that these people get excited. Mm -hmm. They come in for a variety of ways. Maybe they care about the mission. Maybe they care because a friend asked them. But then they tend to not come back. And mm -hmm. so yeah. let's turn our attention to that. 
what can we do in those situations, especially in this current environment? How how does how does the lessons that we're seeing when it comes to multi-channel apply here, folks? Yeah, I think it's interesting. I think they don't come back because we often scare them away with our communications. Maybe you know, like um, maybe we they come one time because a friend asked them to donate to their peer-to-peer -peer campaign or a crowdfunding event or a giving day or something like that, and then we're like. Oh, we got a new name. And then we overwhelm them with the wrong communications, perhaps, without really like understanding them first and what their motivation to give was. So I think the way to fix that is to really like look at our communication, like really take a hard look at it and say, like, how are we talking to these people who are new on the file as opposed to just putting them into, well, now they're on the file and they're going to get like the spray and pray approach. And so I think that's where data comes into the fold and we have to actually get better at data. Um, I also think it's interesting like to think about the parallels between this report and like what's happening in our environment right now. Like the crowd is speaking. The people are rising up and speaking and saying, no, I'm not okay with this, right? Like they're speaking up to the, you know, I, those in the ivory tower, right? And so it's like major giving is down in this report, but general giving from the crowd is up. And I think this shows us that we need to listen to the crowd a little bit more and try to really speak to the crowd. So Clay, you look like you're thinking. Oh, no, no he, he he's about to go off. Go off, this Clay. Rant. I mean, this is my <laughs> yeah, rant, exactly. Taylor, and you're, you're, you're setting you me up. You got something, you right? got something there. I think we are at a critical juncture in the profession right now. I, I, I think this is a this is a major opportunity for us to look at fundraising and for lessons for us to learn right now, both from the pandemic and from what we're seeing across society. I think you're exactly right. Right, the world has stood up and said no. The world the world as it exists. I and and let's let's be completely bipartisan and agnostic to political standing here. The world is standing up and saying, the world as it exists, I do not accept and I want to make change. That is what donors mm -hmm. are telling us whenever they make a gift to a nonprofit. That really is what a gift to a nonprofit is. This problem that exists, I don't accept and I'm going to give money that I go off and, and earn, right? I'm going to give it and I'm going mm -hmm. to make this change happen because I believe in this world that could be through my giving. So yeah, Taylor, your point is correct. In many cases, we get into a communication stream that we bombard them or overwhelm them, or conversely, we don't get into a communication stream at all. It's one or the other. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't want to compare the current situation to a party, but, but, but think about, you go to a really great party and the energy is high and everybody has a wonderful time and you meet this great new person and like at that party, it's, this is my new best friend, right? And you exchange numbers, and then you never hear from them, right? And they drift off into, and you might, you friended them on Facebook or on Twitter or whatever, and you might see their occasional posts, but that connection is gone. That's the challenge to us in the midst of this. So many charities and nonprofits reported just ex extremely high levels of giving throughout the pandemic. The mistake that we can make is to not immediately come back to in, in, huge humble gratitude to thank those donors for stepping up at, at arguably one of the world's worst moments and also keep keep them engaged with with what they have made happen and keep reporting that back to them getting out of the mindset tim yes renewal but getting out of the mindset of this is a transactional relationship and i'm pushing yep. for the renewal and more into the values-based relationship that that this is this is something they believe in, and I'm going to keep telling them how their gift has made change. So yeah. I want to transition a little bit toward, or, or Taylor, go ahead. Let me just follow up that real quick. Yeah, um, yep. I think when when someone gives, to Clay's point, like, it's for a reason. It's rising up and saying, hey, like, I don't agree with this, and I'm going to give money to be part of the change. That gives everyone an experience of joy in mm -hmm. that moment. Mm -hmm. And so, but what happens is we break down the joy if we don't ever talk to them again, I love your party example, or we overwhelm them. And so we've got mm -hmm. to figure out how to keep 
giving them that joy, whether it's through informing them about how their money then informed the change and like, hey, since you last gave to us, here's what we've done that's, you know, taken steps towards X, Y, Z. And thanking them regularly. Like we often throw them into the second ask before we even thank them and like help them go back. Like I want to give them that experience of joy again through the thank you, right? Like you gave, remember that? That felt good. We feel good Mm -hmm. about that. We appreciate Mm -hmm. you. Before you inform the next interaction, which also should be another interaction to bring them back to that joy. And 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 supporting it. I'm so sorry, Tim, and supporting it in multi-channel ways to reiterate different experiences. The tactile feel when we have an address, the tactile feel of opening an envelope that's personally addressed to you and and popping open a gorgeous letter with a picture and, you know, your name in it, you know, um, the, the personalized email, the post, right? How do we, how do we bring that through into multiple learning styles? Because we all experience things differently. So building on those different experiences to create that joy across platforms becomes the key. Mm -hmm. Tim, we'll let you speak now. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, (laughs) It's, it's welcome guys. So the, what's fascinating, uh, you know, I always, I always think one that's, that's, why I think of it as like a feedback loop and it's very iterative. Mm-hmm. Like that's mm-hmm. that's where I want us to shift our thinking where it's like, I, it's not on to the next one. It's that this is a rolling wave yeah. of engagement that happens people. Yep. And, yeah. and, 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 and I have a bracelet. Maybe, All these could little be a loops bracelet. are interconnected and that's Jeff, it. Jeff Brooks <laughs> has used the, the idea of like streams coming back in, like, mm-hmm. like you have the water and mm-hmm. stuff like that. And so there's a lot of, there's a lot of, um, it's basically don't think of it as a linear relationship. Time is a flat circle, all of that type of stuff, right? But but it reminds me mm-hmm. from a practical standpoint, one of the, and I remember this over a decade ago, I was in Chicago, I was attending a, a seminar, uh, trying to learn to be a good fundraiser. And and um, and it was put on by, uh, um, you know, kind of a social justice organization, because that's what I was working for. And I was just learning to be a fundraiser. And one of the things that the presenter told told the crowd was you know i just gave to a a a prominent national nonprofit, and uh and i thought it was a pretty good amount and then the next communication i received was another appeal and Mm -hmm. what that said to me was thanks for playing try again Mm -hmm. and that i've never forgotten that and so Mm -hmm. i want to uh, boo! Exactly, Mary Kalan. So Mary, Mary Kalan's in the crowd, by the way, another Neon One consultant. She actually wrote, interesting and heartening that the smaller donors, quote unquote, are the ones giving. Those are the also the people who are hurting the most right now. And I yeah. think that that's a good point. And, and I think that uh, this speaks to the power of resilience, the power of, of, of where people step up when they're most needed and when they're asked as well. Um, if they feel appreciated, and and uh, and I think that people want to help. I think that a lot of times, and there's been studies on this in terms of of even you know class breakdown of of you know who gives what and and things of that nature. But um, I think it's always important to treat any size gift as as something special. There's also capacity issues, and I want to shift into our next point around technology and the role of that um, around change very shortly. But um, I think that, you know, you could put processes in place, you can put structures in place to make sure that, that no matter what size gift somebody feels appreciated. I think that's, that's, I, that's mm-hmm. an important thing that, you know, if you haven't done it in these last six months or so, this is a good time to step back, find the time, make the time, prioritize the time to look at your processes, your copy. Are you using copy that was, was from two years ago, four years, like how old is your copy? Are you asking literally the same thing? Do people open up and go, yeah, I got that last year, you know? So so this is a good time to take a breath and review. Um, I wanna shift into to the idea of, of change 
and technology because a lot of things that we sometimes hear, and it's not even necessarily technology, but I, I think Taylor can speak to this. Clay, you could speak to the process side as well. Um, both of you can. We've always done it that way. The yeah. phrase, we've always done it that way. Well, we've always done it that way, or now is not a good time to change things or, or things of that nature. What do we say? Because I love the idea and what you said, Clay, around when somebody makes a gift, actually both of you, yeah, both of you, when somebody makes a gift, they're, they're saying, I want to make a change. I want to make a change in this problem that you have. And let me know if anybody else mm -hmm. lost audio, please, please uh, confirm audio or not. But um, uh, the idea that a donor wants to make change, but that our organizations are scared of change to yeah. get there. How do we address that? Whew. I got Thank some you. thoughts on this one. Uh, well, um, un let's unpack them. Let's unpack them. Because we deal with this all the time, right? So, yeah, all the time. And, you know, something that, like, it's, it's just still mind-boggling to me is that we in the nonprofit industry, like, we're the change maker industry for the world, right? Like we're the, we're going to fight poverty and we're going to cure cancer and we're going to save the environment. Like we're those people. And so for some reason, it's baffling that when we get into our like internal structures and roles and, you know, into the board meeting, like change is such uh, an uphill battle all the time. And so I think it starts with every person listening on the line here today to think about what can you do internally at your organization to change that conversation. Um, we often just get like held back by perfection, by this need for perfection. Um, my, I have a saying and it's launched is better than perfect. Like you're never going to get to change if you don't risk things and you don't try something and you don't launch it and then learn from it and iterate it. And that's really something that I think digital gives us a lot of like flexibility around because you can launch something and you can put it out there on your website and oh, guess what? You can just log into your WordPress and go like, if that verbiage wasn't quite right, you can go yep. tweak it. So I get that like digital is a really great way to test and try new things. Whereas like direct mail, once you have something sent off to the print, like it's done, oh, I hope we didn't get that wrong, right? But digital is a good way to start thinking through like changing things and trying new stuff you know so and let's drill into that because somebody did say you know and let's i love the full disclosure approach because because they said is there an agenda for this webinar where is this going so i think that's a fair question in terms of you know we did state up front that this would be a free-flowing conversation but maybe we can drill into the tactical elements now in terms yeah. of, of employing multi-channel which was ultimately the point of this webinar so so Clay, let's let's kick it over to you for that, and then Taylor, I want you to talk a little bit about the resource that you've developed for this too. So tactics, right? And what every, what everybody needs is how, a specific how. How do I do this? How do I accomplish this? With with the goal always in front of the fundraiser is more donors giving more dollars, right? That's and how do I how do I do that? How do I implement a multi-channel program? How do I? I think though we are at a critical juncture. And I understand the weight of what I'm saying here. I think we have to right now at this time in history, take a moment and our, our governance and our boards need to be on this and start seriously asking, how are we going to change our approach and our thinking about what we're doing? The, the call is in front of us loudly and loudly, loudly and loudly yep. that, that what donors are saying to us through the levels of giving that we have seen through the pandemic, through what we're seeing with the, these movements and communities rallying together, donors are saying to us, we are placing values in front of everything, what we believe and what we want to support. I, Tim, you and I have had this conversation a thousand times, and I say it as often as I can. In the United States, for sure, and in many democratic societies, we have two ways of expressing our democracy and our agency. One is through our vote, and the second is through our philanthropy. There is 
almost no other better way for a community or people to say what they believe in and what they value than by what they give. That to me is both a strategic and thoughtful, but also a tactical statement right now to for us as a profession to invest the time to go, how do we as a profession finally, finally, because I know when you were in Chicago, I know how long ago that discussion was, and we are still having it yep. 20, 30 years later than I know of, right? How do we as a profession finally get the message that what donors want is to feel valued, to be, to feel important, to be, to be treasured and to be important. So the tactics of that is how we answer that question. How am I going to value donors for their gift? And that, and the answer is, I'm going to get a thank you letter out in 48 hours and it's going to be warm and fuzzy and I'm going to report back on how their gift was used and all the things that we know from Penelope Burke and Ken Burnett and donor centered fundraising and we're going to implement all of these and, and Adrian Sargent and Jen Shank. I know I'm trying to grab if I have the books to right. show everybody. Yeah, we should, like, we... That shelf. Um, <laughs> this is fiction. Um, right, right. It's, it's implementing all of those things. Fine finally committing to owning it we all want a world we we and, and i think in some ways we're still clinging to a world that's going to come back and at some point here there's going to be a magic moment we can start up all of our galas again and um funders are going to go back to funding the way they were that world is over and if it does come back it's a year away at least so what are we going to do for the next three six nine twelve months these are the questions i think the tactical questions i think we have to be asking and driving with our leadership and our boards to really look at how do we as an organizational identity value that that import that donors of all levels have placed in us and some somebody wrote uh uh you know need to stay close to your mission statement you know, don't lose focus. Mm -hmm. I think that's an important point. So mm -hmm. from a from another tactical standpoint, because I actually want to uh, help us end mm -hmm. on on a little nice case study that we've seen in terms of that helped meld these together. So you can actually tactilely look yeah. at, okay, how does somebody actually employ this in a real way? But Taylor, you know, Firefly mm -hmm. put together a really great resource when it comes to understanding a lot of these digital tools. Because look, at the end of the day, direct mail, you get paper, you get a printer, things, that type of stuff. Um, and we're getting some great questions that are starting to come in. So I wanna leave time for that. But Taylor, talk about the resource real quick and then I'll debut an example of that in practice actually. Yeah, perfect. And I wanna really quickly, getting into the resource, I think I didn't really actually get to my, like the definition of the impact loop, but like all of this ties together, direct mail and digital and the technology that we featured in the guide. But I wrote this little definition earlier this morning, the impact loop to me, it, it's the continual investment and in what you put in to making the impact through your internal culture, your storytelling and brand, and your technology that empowers you to drive efficient fundraising performance and delivering your impact, right? So it's like, it's all of these things that actually work together. It's the, the loop uh, of the bracelet, right? Like how you, how you engage in every interaction. So technology empowers all of that, particularly today, right? And we don't know how long that's going to be lasting in terms of like our total reliance on digital, right? Um, so we put together the guide. I know that technology can be overwhelming. Like it's kind of like this, uh, there's all the things mentality that can very quickly make us like feel kind of cloudy. And um so what we did is we, we do this every couple of years. We look at the nonprofit like technology market and we as a third party agency that works on all of these different platforms puts together a guide that says, hey, here's the solutions in the industry that we've used and we know and we trust and we think do a really good job at X, Y, and Z. And we break that down into basically like, what are your goals and outcomes as an organization? Do you want to start a peer to peer campaign? Do you want to get your CRM in order, like have better data? Um, do you want to do more advocacy? And so we break down different tools on the marketplace in those areas. We have a little grid at the beginning of the guide that lets you kind of see at a high level what different tools we evaluated and where those fall into in terms of like, their function within your organization. 
And then we break it down and make it easy to sort of like shop for your software by kind of giving you an overview of like features, functions, and pricing mm -hmm. so that you can get an idea in one place. It's a lot to wrangle. You know, and and there's yeah, not too, there's not too many of these objective guides out there, uh, which is why we wanted to highlight this one because you know we're part of it, but there's also a lot of other great platforms yeah. too. Um, uh, Taylor, by the way, somebody was asking for a copy of that loop definition. If you could pop that on over to me afterwards, then uh, we'll we'll put that. Maybe uh, uh, Rachel, we could pop that into our social media feed. Um, you know, it's like cool. a nice little pull quote. So um want to show Thank an you. example of an organization that, that I think did a lot of this during the coronavirus period really well, by the way. Um, so they used our Rallybound platform for digital fundraising peer-to-peer, -peer, and it was the San Antonio Food Bank. And so one, they hilariously raised a goal of $1. But then what they did was that they had a rolling timeline in terms of a note you know, that, that that's also something that, that could be sent as a follow-up. They had a lot of different um, videos, lots of video engagement, lots of different people in terms of what who they were hearing from. All Faiths Friday, right? Pastors, rabbis, like, like you just, even from this, you get a good sense of what's happening, what's the mission here? Mm -hmm. And then making it super easy to donate um, you know, making all this information flow into the CRM, uh, which they had uh, and they set up, you know, and then being able to follow this up with with phone calls and physical mail and and all these other things. This is a really easy way that that uh, that tactilely shows how you can employ this digital technology in a way that's like, look at how many faces there are, like the written letter, like they put that in in a multi-channel way which I thought was pretty cool. Can you um, go back to can you go back to that front page, Tim? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. I, like I, I wanted to make a quick point if I could. Right. These these do not look like mass produced slick videos. Mm -hmm. This is I think such an important lesson. We don't have to be as buttoned up as we used to be. We're all okay now. Even our major donors are okay now with videos that were filmed in your living room on your iPhone that just get popped online. We, 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 I, I'm, I'm, I'm hearing that comment of, you know, where is this going, right? What is the takeaway that I can go with? And, and one key takeaway is let's, let's release ourselves from, as Taylor said, that the curse of perfectionism and recognize that something as simple as this and as straightforward as a, as just a quick video posted out can have, far more impact than the 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 mass produced video with all of the technology that you wanted right and sh shared throughout their community right like Damn. 390 shares on social media now i we're coming up to our our time but i had i think there's a really excellent question that jamie posted uh, i'm going to read it in its entirety the world feels messy right now this mm. is our opportunity to position ourselves as thought leaders who are helping to make sense of the world during a time when we, as the change makers, per Taylor's point, are leaders. Any tips on how we can position ourselves as thought leaders, taking this time to strengthen our voice in the community across multiple channels, which will naturally lend itself mm. to better fundraising? Before I kick it over to you, I would say that San Antonio Food Bank is a really good example of that in terms of being the thought leaders because look at all the different people that they collected together right all the different voices that they collected together and i actually think that just like how neon one approaches things is that you become a leader by recognizing that you are stronger together mm -hmm. you are stronger together yeah. and so be, looking for the connections in your community even I was talking to a local community foundation earlier today, and what they were trying to do is figure out how all the different food banks in their community were, could potentially work and collaborate with each other. That is leadership. Now, mm -hmm. let's kick it over to you two, though, to kind of have some ending thoughts on that. Could, I you, think read that one, could you read it one more time? There's a phrase in there I wanted to be sure I captured, please. Okay, let me let me grab it. Sorry. Let me, no, no, no. I think it's it's a brilliant, beautiful question. I'm going to ask the. I'm going to frame the question. Any tips on how we position ourselves as thought leaders, taking this time to strengthen our voice in the community across multiple channels, which will naturally lend itself to better fundraising? Right. So, um, first, first, I want to say it's very easy to look at a food bank 
or, or other critical need and go, oh, well, of course, during the pandemic, you know, they were critical needs. So of course, they raised tons of money. Mm, fair to a point, but also many non-critical organizations saw an increase in fundraising because people really grappled to values. My response to that question is to emerge as leaders, to, to drive this change, to be a part of being that thought leader and the leader in the community is to shift our stories to what you, the donor, the community are saying through our mission. Get ourselves out of the mix. It's not about who we are as an organization. It's about who, who the individual donor, the specific donor in the community sees themselves through the work that we get to do because of them. You, you become a thought leader mm -hmm. by elevating them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And giving mm -hmm. them agency. Mm -hmm. that's, that's where I was trying to connect with, right? We get, we, they're getting agency and ownership and leadership through giving to us, and we support them in that. Love it. Taylor? Mm -hmm. I love that. Yeah, I mean, I, uh, at a high level, I'll say this to tack on to that, Clay. Like, your cause has a connection to the current environment no matter what that cause is, we are all in this environment together right now. And so just find a way to connect the dots through the language and the words that you use to relate to everyone uh, in your community on that connection. And then what I'll say is I've been talking like very, getting very tactical and some practical examples and ideas is thinking through how you can, as a nonprofit thought leader, put out content that's relevant to those people in your community through webinars and podcasts and things like that. I was talking to um, a friend recently who works at Coma New York, and they can't currently facilitate all of the programs that they facilitate to patients, right? Because they can't meet. And so they've instead been doing like tea times over Zoom and stuff like that and still facilitating that sense of community and yep. so you as a leader at the organization can harness and embrace the tools and the technology to still bring the community together just through those digital channels. And I think webinars, podcasts are a great way to do that. Yep. Yeah. And even, even hosting, you know, uh, different Zoom meetings directly with a few select donors, things like that. I've seen those community mm -hmm. nights happen and and eventually what we can do and get comfortable depending on your community uh and and your your region is you know have socially distant events eventually too you know small to yeah. start and then we can get to that uh i would i would uh you know be beware the gala this year uh i will say um i think practically speaking you should have a plan a a, a b and then a plan v for virtual so mm -hmm. um any any final thoughts? Uh, fo well, actually, any final questions, folks? I think we reined it in. I think we got it. I think we got it focused, hopefully. <laughs> um, but uh, but yeah, loud and clear, we heard that. Um, any other questions, folks? You know, the last thing I'll say too, just yeah. real quick tip about digital is like short format, more frequent. So yeah. don't feel like you have to create a two-hour-long video. Instead create 25-minute minutes. Minutes videos and just, yeah. yeah, over time, put those out in different ways, you know? So think about like short format, more frequent, very authentic. Those things work in a digital realm. And, and, and I'll say support that with, you know, with, with paper and mail that is longer format with lots of great pictures yeah. and tactile. Boom! And Boom, multi-channel, and yes, very yeah. helpful. Was That's recorded, so I can hear it again. So mm -hmm. awesome, yeah. And we, uh, yes, we can, we are gonna be sending that out. Don't worry, folks. And and just from a, uh, thank you. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, and folks, you know, we do try to do some very kind of, uh, and actually the generosity exchange coming up in August is gonna have some very like specific workshop things where it's gonna be like, okay, let's literally work through Excel spreadsheets, right? So mm -hmm. we try to, we try to in our content, hit a lot of different things. And, and today I know it was a little bit more philosophical, but I think that we need those types of, of conversations. And that's why I brought Taylor and Clay on for today because we need to sometimes get out of our own head and our own processes and kind of shake it up a bit. And that's hopefully what I think we did 
for you folks today. But uh, shake it up for us. Shake it up for us. Um, you know, tell us what you're doing. Go to Twitter and use hashtag NPOs Rise and tell us what you're doing in terms of how you're managing your multi-channel. And uh, definitely we're going to be sharing out some of the resources and links and follow up for sure. Um, Taylor, Clay, always a pleasure. Always a thank pleasure. You for, thank, thank you. Thank you for having us. All right. Thank you. Okay. We'll be putting all this up. Thank you very much. Appreciate your time that you've spent with us yeah. today. And, uh, you know, we'll see you out there. Check us out on Twitter. We're all also on there. Fundraising Twitter as well. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Have a good day. Bye, y'all. Bye. Thanks.